approaching Turkish airspace. Change your heading south immediately. Let me try some. That's one, two, three. Okay, so we got another option for a dual role prism optic in town called the AVCI from 3E in Turkey. You may have watched the Brass Facts video on it already, and that's cool. This thing had some issues to be resolved, but this video is going to be a little bit different. I've had this optic for several months and wanted to share some more specific details about it with you, since it's a direct competitor to the Elkan Spectre. Let's just compare all of the features head to head and then give some feedback about where this optic is and where it can go moving forward. You want to talk about an appealing entrance with its high quality product label, lockable holes, super strong latches, a durable carry handle made out of thick solid construction. Open this thing up and wow, talk about a premium case unlike the less than ideal Elkin offering. This thing is waterproof with a full seal with very fine laser cut foam to hold the contents. Inside we have a waterproof QR code to learn about the product on the website, star keys for the top dot and something else I'm not sure of, a windage adjustment tool, a lens cleaning cloth, a kill flash that screws into the front of the optic, not nearly as nice as the Elkan version, and also a scope cover that is specifically tailored for this optic, which may double down as a beret for your Turkish military service. You have four laser cut slots for your extra CR2032 batteries, not included. And finally, the AVCI and their M1X red dot up top. What a presentation. Quite the flex so far, but is it as good as the package it comes in? I had a strange feeling once this random maple leaf decided to pass by in the background. What are the frickin' chances? 100% random, I swear, and I think this was a sign from the Elkin gang that's here to watch. Right off the rip, you can see the Spectre is just a hair longer, mainly due to the extension in the front, which the 3E offering does not have, and the slightly longer mount. Depending on the view you find online, the Elkin may look much larger, yet when swapped around, you can see they're pretty close in size and width. Finish-wise, the Elkin is more of a flat hard coat anodized, whereas the Turkish version is more of a shiny anodized over sandblasted aluminum. The Elkin seems to be a forged optic that is machined afterwards, where the ABCI looks to be directly machined from billet material. The website did not list the material used, but my guess is 6061, and my hopes are 7075, which I believe is what the Elkin uses on top of these steel backup sights on top, missing from its twin from the east. This isn't necessarily a bad thing though, because shorter irons suck to use and hits your nods at night shooting passive, which this slick top actually saves your nods from hitting the hard steel iron sights under presentation. Weight-wise, the Turk is 25.3 ounces, with the top dot included, about 2 ounces less without it, at 23.3 ounces, and the Elkin is 22 ounces without the top dot, probably another 2 ounces with it, so there isn't really a weight difference that you'd notice. Both optics have a 32mm front objective, with the front lens further to the front of the AVCI, since the Elkin has the kill flash extension here. This does slightly affect light transmission, which under night vision I was surprisingly able to use easier in good passive conditions on 1X compared to the Canadian choice. I was quite surprised that the front lens being so far forward was able to allow more light in that I actually noticed it. Some of this also has to do with the stock height as well. The AVCI sits higher up, which allowed me to get lined up behind the optic a little bit better. But again, there's a reason the top dot option is available. This higher body also allows you to sneak a can of dot to the side under the body like the Arasaka, where the Elkin will require you to eat up even more rail space. After all, the longer Elkin mount already eats up more space, but we'll find out why in a bit. This higher body also helps get you above IR devices on your rail, which blocks your view on 1X, a good reason you don't see the Elkin gang running IR lasers that much. It kind of defeats that purdy 1X that they brag about. Oh, I still don't prefer a prism to be this high out of the gate since okay, it also well, puts top your top dot that much higher, so it's a trade-off. To the rear, they both share a close eye relief distance of 72 and 70 millimeters, which you can see have a similar eye box when beyond this range. As far as glass clarity goes, the Elkin seems to have the better glass when using them side by side, but let me tell you, the competition has some very high quality glass as well. This is more on the line of HD Japanese glass and will serve you just fine. They definitely didn't cheap out here. 
Overall, these optics will feel very similar in use getting your sight picture, but I gotta point out that there's no option for a flip cap of any type on the back of the AVCI, which I believe is useful for a true combat optic to keep rain and debris off of the rear lens. This can be the difference in being able to use this sight out to distance when needed, or on its 1x feature, including the top dot. Maybe it just doesn't rain in Turkey, but it does where I live. Back to passive aiming options, the top dot mount here is held in place by four screws rather than the two here, which I think is less robust. A surprise bonus on the Turkish version. Speaking of mounts on the left, only one clamp is present to secure the optic, unlike two on the Elkan. This is a vital flaw in the Turkish optic, which we'll get to later. Both have a recoil tab here in roughly the same location, even though the Elkan has a much longer mount. The Turkish optic clamp uses a LaRue style slide lock. Tighten the outside tension screw here, then tighten the clamp and slide the locking tab here. This does have a small catch here that interlocks with the slide, but strangely enough, if you push up hard enough, you can unlatch it and unlock the mount, but again, more on that later. These mount levers are not on the same side either. The Elkin chose the ejection port side so that one, it does not rub on your gear, potentially getting caught or unlatching, and two, so that you can still rack the charging handle to the rear. You can get these optics back pretty far for a better eye relief on 4X, which is no problem for the Elkan, unless you're a lefty, that is. The Turkey Boy chose the left side, which if all the way back to the rear does block your hand from racking the charging handle. You'll have to keep this guy a bit further forward to avoid any charging handle blockage. Both elevation dials at the rear must be unlocked and locked when finished zeroing. On the Elkin, you can slide this tab up, dial to zero, and then slide it back into place to lock it. And on the other, you tighten the screw clockwise, dial in zero, and then lefty loosey it back out to lock the dial. Backwards and confusing, but yeah, I didn't design it. Up top, they have their own M1X red dot, which shares the doctor footprint of the Elkan, an obvious form of flattery, at the expense of options for us. This top dot seemed to do what it's supposed to, although it feels cheap, and mine was visible just fine, unlike the one Brassfax had that likes to cut itself in half as you change the vertical viewing angle. Now we can get to the fun part and the reason I wanted one of these optics in the first place. We all know the Elkan lever has to be pressed down before sliding it between magnifications, and if you watched my Elkan video, this can sometimes be hard to do on the fly, and especially when slippery or wet. This also had a higher probability to get caught on gear, which they tried to stop with these upward cuts that hold it from moving unless you press it down first. This is all because the prism in the Elkan is installed from the bottom of the optic here where the ottoman is installed from the right side and the screws have been coated with a silicone of some kind to prevent user removal, probably voiding the warranty. But I have no idea long term how it hold up. The prism orientations on these are what allow the Turkan to rotate vertically between 1 and 4x and the OG Elkan to rotate horizontally with its bottom axis. The Turkish version with its vertical orientation allows you to simply slap it forward or back much faster on the fly and it is a bit easier to find since it's the only protruding part on this side. See how I'm like right back Yeah, you can end. just nudge it with your wrist. You don't yep. even have to really grab it. Yeah, I don't have to grab it with my finger. Yeah, you can just smack it. Yeah, so here. That's kind of nice. That's what I like the best about this. Now yeah. let me see the Elkin. Yeah. So it's real hard to do that. Yeah. So this. That's what happens all the time, right? Because you have to push down, then forward, then up, so. Tink, tink, tink. See what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of like this hits. This hits. It's kind of like hidden in there. But they needed to do that to keep it like out of the way. Yeah. So and you're, you're on your pew pew on one and just smack your palm of your thumb forward. It may be faster, but some people have trouble with the lever being kind of short and end up missing on the swipe. See, it just needs to be a little longer. This lever is very strong with a positive click to hear and feel when it's locked into its magnification level, maybe from an internal detent of some kind. Since it can also get slippery when wet, I do think it needs to be extended just a bit more, maybe even with some kind of knurling for grippage. As far as batteries go, they both use a CR2032, which gives you about hours with the Turkan and hours with the Elkin based on a mid-level brightness. The Elkan cap is a bit harder to get off since the dial likes to rotate on you, where the Turkish cap is a standalone that's much easier to remove. Both optics have a left side illumination control with softer rubber buttons on the Turkey Boy. Press plus to turn it on and hold down to turn it off. Same goes for the top red dot. Let's first mention the biggest bummer functionally with this optic. 
It has no center dot option like the LCAN does, which kind of ruins the One X experience. The whole point of the dual roll optic was to give the user a quick red dot for close work, and here you're stuck using the full reticle illumination. As soon as I got this thing and realized it did not have this feature, I almost put it right back in the box. Doing up close work with a full illuminated reticle was not nearly as intuitive or as fast, but it also has more trouble defeating white light in some cases. <laughs> me, this sucks. Well, we're not even to the worst part, so let's see the brightness levels. The Elkan has five settings for the full reticle and nine for its no dot clone. So naturally the Turcan should have a brighter full reticle because the Elkan intended this for night use only. At night, you don't want this reticle to get too bright because it will blow out what's behind it, possibly the thing you're trying to shoot, but I will say, once turned down a bit, the Turcan actually has the better reticle, which is much thinner. It doesn't cover as much at night compared to the Elkan, even though a dim dot would be preferred, but this thing brings up a bonus in my opinion. The Turkish Optic actually has the better reticle in my opinion, which I share with Brassfax. It still has a center dot we like, but smaller as well as an overall thinner reticle, which allows you to take more precisely aimed shots without covering too much of your target downrange. It's a shame they couldn't give us a center dot illumination, because boy does the Elkin get big when fully illuminated. This thin reticle is great for taking precision shots and also includes mill ranging lines, which the Elkin does not, but both could honestly sneak in some wind holds in a next gen version. Overall, I like the Turkish optic reticle better. I think that about covers everything, so let's get to the epic downfall of this optic. If you paid close attention in the video, you may have noticed that the plastic plate behind the mount lever was snapped. All three of these optics imported all broke in the same exact spot. As I used this optic, I thought it had been losing zero from the mount coming loose, but it was actually this plastic piece breaking. And when separated, it had slop, tricking me into thinking this screw was coming loose. The company is sorting this out from a manufacturer defect, but that's not all. Remember earlier I said that this optic uses a single clamping point, and the Elkin uses two. Well first I sent Brassfax a laser test that he recommended. I simply mounted the optic and zeroed my Viz laser to the center. This was about 15 yards away, and then I simply twisted the optic and then let go to see if the optic and laser would both return to center. They did not, so I twisted the opposite way, only to find it had so much slop that it was off in the whole other direction. As one last test, I took some shots after twisting it a few times and tracked my shot at 20 yards. You can see the impact shifting to the right after the twist, almost 4 inches on the final shot. This was at 20 yards, which multiplied by 5 for 100 yards. This last shot would be off 20 inches. Times that by 3 on a 300 yard target and you'd be off 60 inches to the right. Unacceptable. It was due to the plastic plate behind the QD that had cracked due to a plastic injection molding material problem. This is why all three models had the same exact issue. We gave this feedback to 3E and they thought maybe it was some camera trickery, so I went and did another test. I first secured the optic by tightening the outside screw enough that it was hard to close the latch. After that, to prove there's no trickery, I had one camera on me, one filming through the optic as I shoot it, and a GoPro on target to track any deviation from trauma. Ready? Yep. Now enjoy the results. Now, I'm gonna twist the optic. Come get my hand right here real quick. Watch this. I'm just gonna put force this way and this way. Yep. Last shot. That way they know it's not me. I'm holding a camera is the problem with the laser. Alright, put on save. We go look at the target. This is at 20 yards, not very far. It's raining, man. Here's what I'm gonna do. I twisted it this way, so I'm gonna hit the back. Ready? Yep. Here it goes, I'm gonna take it. And now I do it again, because I got the GoPro out there. All right. 
Ready? Yep. All right. I'm gonna hit the front. There it goes. Wow. That one was super far. So if you mess with the front. So the front's the weak point, watch this. Wait to see how far that one is. The front is the point that affects more than hitting the back. So watch. Watch when I hit uh, on the GoPro footage, you're gonna see it. Here it goes. Let me do another one. Here we go, just one more. Yeah, I was over by the furthest one to the right. Another four inches to the left. Even when clamped down to the max, it still would not hold zero. Unacceptable and any good features this optic had, like the side lever, don't even matter now if it can't hold a zero. Case closed on this optic for now. I'm not done with this thing just yet because I had some ideas. 3E has since fixed the material issues used on this clamping point, but I'm still suspecting that only using a single clamping point will be an issue. Even with the new mount material, we need to talk about single point clamping. As a simple demonstration, let's first take a steel pipe and have someone take a strong grip on center to represent a single clamping point and see that no matter how hard you squeeze it, you cannot stop it from being rotated. Now if we take two clamping points and then try to rotate it again, you cannot twist the bar out of place. It's not my opinion that two clamping points are better than one. This is another reason why I like mounts on my optics that use at least two cross bolts or two QD rather than one, which is probably why the Elken knew to use two QD points. The first thing I did was remove the QD bolt assembly. It's no good if the plastic is cracked and won't hold a zero, but what about a solid bolt? We first took a larger 1032 screw for strength, threw it on a lathe so the cap would fit into the optic base hole, and then clipped off the extra length and voila. Problem is, this looks terrible, so I bought some new black hardware the next day so I could actually use the hand knob to tighten it to the rail and then use an Allen key to crank her down. This looks much better, and this thing clamps down onto the receiver like a boss and hopefully now holds zero. Feels solid. <laughs> Now I did enjoy this vertical rotating lever much better than the Spectre lever, and usually didn't have any hangups actuating it unless wet or an occasional miss during swipe. Other shooters had a harder time with it since it was much shorter, causing them to break their sight picture to find it because it really does need a longer lever. I first thought I could chop a Trijicon AccuPoint throw lever down a bit and bolt it on, which wasn't gonna work. $80 down the drain. We then thought the latch from the QD lever we removed would do the trick, but it was pretty thin without a good way to bolt it or weld it. Now we can remove the factory switch lever. Not sure what's under this thing or if it'll break any seals, but someone's got to do it. We popped the stock lever off, no seals to worry about, and installed our new extended lever onto the optic using the same screw that we took off. It has a solid tight fit made of strong polymer that moves just like the factory switch did. No flex since it's a bit thicker, and the detents give a nice audible click just like before. This does stick out a bit because it's for testing and we'd probably give it a profile closer to the optic if this was a final draft, but we gotta get this thing out to the range. Even though it's about 15 degrees out here, the lever functions perfect, no hangups. As far as speed goes, yes, it's much easier to find the lever by motion without having to take your eyes off the target. much, much better with a slight longer lever. While we're out here, we should test our new non-QD mount. Can this thing hold zero now under abuse? Here at 50 yards, I'm gonna get a reference hit and then hit the front like before, which caused the impact shift and see if it moves.
Well, good news, aside from my freezing fingers and watering eyes from the 15 degree weather, this optic is definitely much better and trustable with this direct bolt method. 3E is currently fixing our models to do something that shouldn't lose zero, but at least we know a direct bolt method is much more reliable than a QD. One last thing I wasn't sure about. Back when comparing the BDCs with the Elkin next to the AVCI BDC, the two didn't seem to have the same drops for 556. These are on the exact same magnification, which I can prove by comparing the terrain features from both videos, like the tracks in the snow, or even my steel C-zone target to the left, side by side. If we shoot some lines between the two, you can see the differences here. Now the AVCI is supposed to be for the 16-inch Turkish KCR 556, which makes sense why the lines would have slightly closer increments on the AVCI for the higher velocity 16-inch barrel. But this 200 meter point here is very confusing, and definitely the 700 meter point here as well, being so close to the 600. Now I'd love to test this even better, but it's way too cold and my camera keeps shutting off losing footage. So we'll come back to this one once the new AVCI comes in. Since we'll possibly see a Gen 2 of this optic, let me offer some recommendations. Lower the optic back down a bit to keep the top dot low. Extend the lever with some extra texture. Add a lip for flip caps, at least on the rear. Get rid of this QD mount and give it two locking points on the mount. To the right side, of course. Move the top dot position forward with plates for different footprints. Trim some weight if you can. Add some wind holds to the reticle and for sake, Add a center dot to this thing, or the Elkin will always reign supreme. While making this video, our contact at 3E definitely took these recommendations to heart and sent out some CAD drawings of these new changes. These guys aren't messing around and totally care about usability like I've never seen before in a company. All of the changes we talked about have been put into effect and once completed, we'll have a final production model. I'll tell you right now, when we get this next gen model, I think we may have a very competitive option for a fraction of the cost of the Elkin. I've bought every optic and firearm that I've ever used in any of my videos, no exceptions, which is why I modify them without caring if it hurts the manufacturer's feelings. Not to mention, this one was $1,500 already and I'm not made of money, so getting it replaced softens the blow a bit. If you think this is because of quality, then think again. I asked 3E what glass they use, and depending on the optic, they use the same premium Japanese glass that all top grade optics use, as well as some models that even have the world renowned shot glass installed, just like the ACOG. This means this optic should be viewed as a premium optic, not a budget optic. In comparison, the current Elkin Spectre will be discontinued for the newer gen Spectre that I just got to see at SHOT Show, which added ambidextrous control levers that reverse backwards on the right side and a new pick rail up top so you can choose the optic you want or even supplement thermal optics if you can't afford the clip-on Germany is using in conjunction up front. This pick rail does put the top dot higher than before which sucks, but they did shave off the top irons to avoid hitting your nods which I do prefer. Sadly, they kept the exact same reticle in the model I saw, which if you watched my Elkin video is quite thick for my liking and does not have any wind holds added. Other than the ambi lever and the top changes, this new version is somehow an extra $1,000, so switch levers must have gone up in price a bit. Kinda hard to swallow this new price in my opinion, which makes this next gen AVCI look like a viable option with the new changes at half the cost, because I know some of you want a quality alternative to the now $3,000 plus Elk Inspector. When I get my hands on the next gen optic, I'll report back because I'm super pumped to try it. That's all I got for you until the new gen AVCI comes out, and I'll see you all in the next video. So thanks again for watching. You all are the best. Stay tuned for my next video because it's one of my favorites to date. This optic was a hidden gem and gives me hope for the future of optics.